Hi, everyone. It's so good to see all of you. My name is Mark Keem. I am a state delegate member of the Virginia House of Delegates, and I have the pleasure and the honor of representing about 85,000 people in a district that we call number 35, which is from Tyson's and part of McLean, Dunloring, Vienna, and Oakton, all the way out to Fair Oaks Mall. And so if you live in that neighborhood, in that area, I want to thank you for the honor of representing you. And if you don't live there, but you want to learn about what's happening in your state, I certainly welcome you today. Today, I'm going to do a, a little bit of an overview of what's happening in our General Assembly, but I want to spend as much time as possible in this 90-minute block that we scheduled for ourselves to talk about probably the most important thing, and I know that's something that is on the minds of every American, let alone every Virginian, which is the vaccines for the dreaded COVID-19. How do we ensure that the vaccine is available and uh, is, are in your arms as quickly as possible? So we'll spend some time talking about that, but before we do, what I thought I would do is just kind of give you an overview now, I know many people are not able to watch this live, and hopefully later, as I send this out to my friends on uh, different social media outlets, as well as in my constituent email, I hope that you can watch different parts of this. I'm not going to be assuming that you're going to spend 90 minutes with me today or at another time. So what I'll do is tell you kind of how I want to break down the time. So if you want to fast forward to a particular time where you want to listen to a particular uh, uh, segment, I'll do so. So we're, it's about 1 o'clock left, 1 o'clock Eastern Standard Time here in Virginia. And by the way, I'm not in Richmond. I would love to be in Richmond, which is the picture behind me. I'm actually in uh, Vienna, Virginia, which is my hometown here. Uh, but starting uh, now for the next couple, three minutes, I just want to give you an overview of, of what the General Assembly is like this year. So maybe for about 10 minutes from now, around two, uh, 1.15 until about 1.30, I'd like to talk about specifically about the bills that I introduced this year, the seven bills that I thought, thought were some of the high priorities that I, I should be able to address, as well as talk about some other issues that are related to what hot topics there will be in this General Assembly. Around 1.30 p.m. my time here, Eastern time, I'd like to turn to uh, talking about the COVID situation, the vaccine in particular. And before we have our special guests join at 1.45, I'd like to spend maybe 10, 15 minutes just laying out what I understand is the situation so that when our guests do arrive, instead of asking them a lot of basic questions that you might have or basic things that we shall be aware of by now, I'd like to cover that in the early part and then let you uh, spend the time with me asking some specific things and the latest information that we ought to have from our state and our local county officials. And then uh, after they're done, because they have a very packed schedule today, once they're done around 2.15 or so, then we'll spend the last maybe five, 10 minutes answering any other questions that might be. So that's how I, I'd like to do the next uh, 90 minutes of this time with you. So with your indulgence, I'd like to start. The, uh, the biggest difference between this General Assembly session in Virginia versus the other 11 that I've had the honor of representing you in and serving in, and frankly, going back all the way to 1619 when the House of Delegates uh, began operations and continue to serve, this is the first year, and obviously so, that we are meeting virtually as opposed to in person. And as much as I love that beautiful building behind me, which is designed by Thomas Jefferson in the, in the 1800s and really uh, came to, together as our symbol of our capital and our unity in our nation, unfortunately, we are not there. In instead, we are all working from our homes or from our offices away from home where we are representing you virtually. The reason is, I know some of you might be curious, our state senators, my state senator, as other uh, 40 members, they are actually meeting in person for the purposes of the floor sessions in Richmond. But the reason why they're able to do so and we are not is because the state senate is only 40 members so plus the clerks and some of the senior staff you're talking maybe what 45 maybe 50 people at most you can squeeze in 50 people into a pretty big auditorium in fact they are at the science museum in virginia and you can spread out social distance and all that 50 people is doable we in the house of delegates on the other hand have 100 members elected Plus, you figure with the clerk and the staff and everything, you're talking 110, 120 people. That's a lot more difficult to spread out in a large enough auditorium that is uh, socially distanced and safe for an entire 45-day session, and all, not to mention the cost factor. So we thought it would be a lot more prudent, and the Speaker of the House, who I, I supported uh, her decision, was to have the House session be done virtually, and then the Senate sessions be done in person, but all the subcommittees and the full committees and all the other negotiations are actually all happening uh, virtually, regardless of which chamber we serve in. The other thing I want to uh, share with you that's different from this year versus all the other years that we've served in the past is that uh, because we're doing everything virtually, uh, meaning that all of our committees and subcommittees are meeting online in Zoom rooms, it's impossible for us to take physical uh, testimony from the members of the public. 
one of the best things about this job is hearing directly from you. You telling me what your priorities are, you telling me your, what your concerns are, and me doing the best I can to represent you and, and fight for your, your agenda in the General Assembly and changing our laws and our procedures. Uh, we can't do that in person, but you still have the ability to do so. The only thing is it's a little bit, little bit of a, a logistical concern. So rather than you just showing up in the room and saying, hey, I'm here to speak, you have to sign up in advance before you can speak and, and make sure your voice is heard. So we do have a process. I'm gonna ask my staff, uh, Janine Gaspari, who's sitting here with me in this room. She's about 10 feet away from me, but she's uh, monitoring our, our, our website here, the, both the Facebook Live and our Zoom. So at some point I'll ask her to upload some information about how you testify if you wanna uh, participate. How do you ensure that your voice can be heard during this general assembly session? So even though we are meeting virtually, rest assured that we are gonna be as transparent, open and accountable to you as much as possible. And in fact, in some ways it's nice because I've heard from a lot of people who testified in the subcommittees and full committees I've been on over the last nine days. I've heard a lot of people saying, hey, I'm glad I was able to speak to you because if I had to drive down at seven in the morning to Richmond, I don't know if I would have made it, but now I can just get up and be in front of my computer and be ready to speak. And when I do speak, I get to see everybody at the same time. And you know, all of us are paying attention to what's being spoken on the screen. And so in some ways, it's certainly a substitute, but I don't think it's a bad substitute. I think it's a workable substitute. So just uh, bear in mind that your state government is doing absolutely the best we can to cope with this crisis at the same time to ensure that your uh, government is continuing to operate the way you deserve it to be. So finally, the last thing that was changed from the way we've done business in the past is that starting this year, uh, well, as some of you who are experts at this will already know, but we have a, the House of Delegates like me, we serve two-year terms. So we're elected in one year and then we serve for two years. And then if we choose to, we run for re-election two years later. And unlike the federal government, our elections happen in odd years. And so some of you might remember a couple of months ago, we had a pretty uh, big election in America. We had a, a new president, we had a number of senators and Congress members elected and, and some lost and such. We were not part of that. Your state assembly members, that people like me and your state senators, your governor, your lieutenant governor, attorney generals, we were not on, on those ballots. And in some ways, thankfully, we were not on that because that was uh, such a, a difficult election cycle. But we get elected the year before and the year after those congressional races in, at the federal level. And so this year in the 2021 regular session, we call this our second year of this the term, the two-year term. And the second year is usually called the short, short session. And the reason why it's called short session is because the constitution of our state actually requires that we meet for 30 days. That's pretty short. That's one month out of a whole year. And uh, on the longer year, the one right before that, we meet for 60 days. And so it's 61 year, 30, another year. This is a 30 uh, day session, but normally it's just been since the, at least the 1970s for the last 50 years or so. As a tradition, people know it's really hard to get a lot of work done in 30 days trying to you know, negotiate between 140 members, politicians, et cetera. And so we normally as a tradition, as a almost like a routine, we extend the session from 30 days to 46 days. That gives us a couple more weeks for us to be able to uh, finish our work. This year, for a lot of reasons, we ended up not being able to do that, which was a real shame that we were not able to uh, have our colleagues on the other side of the aisle agree with us and give us the unanimous or at least the supermajority vote to allow us to have a 46 day session. So currently, as we speak, we are in a 30 day session and we just ended, I believe, day 10. I'm not very good at math, but I believe we we're done with 10, which means, frankly, even though we were just started the session last week, we are one third of the way done with this short session. The good news, though, is uh, even though we weren't able to extend the session automatically with the 46 days, our governor has indicated, and I believe he will, uh, put us back into a special session so that toward the end of this 30 day session, the governor will extend the session through his own uh, abilities through the executive branch. And so we ought to be able to finish your business in the next, uh, I guess we have another, what, 30 days or so left? I can't do math, but we're going to end up by the end of February. So the bottom line is, as difficult and as, as convoluted as my, I may have made it sound, we are going to make sure that all of your voices and your priorities are heard. Now, one last thing, and then I'll switch. It's about 110, 112 now. So I'm going to switch to my agenda and the policies that you expect to see this session. Uh, one big thing that we had to do because of the fact that we're limited in the number of days, we're limited in the ability to meet in person, uh, the virtual session, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, our Speaker of the House said, you know what, instead of having people file, you know, 100 bills or 50 bills or 20 bills, why don't we require each member of the House to file only seven bills? That way, 
we have 700 bills total this uh, house session. And that's a lot more manageable, frankly, because I mean, and I know I, I could put in 100 bills every single day because we have so many issues and concerns that you raise with us. But um, by limiting us to seven, it made us really think about, okay, what's something that we have to get done this year? What, what's such an important thing that we wanna ensure it gets done this year? And so I was able to come up with seven bills, my colleagues all as well. And um, last year I put in 45 bills, had about 20 to 23 of them pass and become law. This year we're doing only seven bills and I'm hoping that I'll pass at least a few. So let me switch, it's about 1.15. I'm gonna to switch to talking about not only the bills that I introduced, the seven bills I just mentioned, but also some of the other issues that we believe will be uh, hot topics. I know I've seen some of these bills already, but you will probably start hearing more about this in your local newspapers or local media and maybe social media as if some of you follow Twitter and Facebook and what have you. These are the, op the issues that we believe the 2021 regular session of the General Assembly in Virginia will be addressing. So uh, first of all, let me just tell you quickly about my seven bills. Some of them are really fun and interesting ones that I was able to do. Some of them are, are a little bit harder and some of them obviously will cost some, some money. So I'm not sure if I can get it done this year, but these are bills that I'm doing on behalf of constituents and other groups that I've worked with stakeholders and interested parties, as well as some of the concerns that were raised nationally in terms of what's happening uh, in, in this day and age. Uh, the first bill I just wanna tell you is because this is actually the first bill that's uh, passed and become, it's already in the, in the uh, state Senate, it already passed the house. Uh, I have heard for a number of years from constituents about uh, smoking, the secondhand smoke. You all know that Virginia was at one point one of the leaders in our nation and probably in the whole world in terms of tobacco production. Tobacco was one of our mainstay industries. And so economically and otherwise, it was something that created uh, Virginia's economy in the very beginning. And of course, back then, very few people knew about any hazards or public health concerns about tobacco. They just did it for economic survival. Well, we know now, obviously, since the 20th century and 21st century, we know how dangerous uh, tobacco, nicotine, and not only in terms of the addiction and the, the lifestyle that people who are addicted have to suffer and the, and the uh, critical health to their lungs and, and heart and such, but more, even more than that, the fact that when you're smoking, your smoke can't be controlled. It goes beyond you and it affects other people, just like the COVID situation that we're talking about. Uh, certainly, you have a right to do whatever you want with your own body in your own house, but once you're affecting other people, like being in a crowd without wearing a mask or being in a crowd and smoking a cigarette, you are affecting other people's rights as well. And so we've taken on as a nation, as a public health priority, the idea that we should try to re reduce and or eliminate secondhand smoke as much as possible, especially uh, in those areas where there's no way for somebody to avoid that. And one of those areas happens to be indoors. Now, uh, I believe Governor Kane in, I can't remember what year, I think it was 2000, maybe seven or eight, he passed a bill in Virginia that was really got some attention nationally because we passed a law that banned smoking in restaurants and, uh, and public uh, places like that. And as a former uh, tobacco state that had done so much economically and were known as the tobacco state, given the, the major tobacco manufacturers have their headquarters here in Virginia, the fact that we took the lead nationally in banning smoking inside restaurants got a lot of attention and rightfully so. And I want to thank uh, Senator Kane and so many other people for doing that. Well, we've since then, we've done a number of different ways to try to reduce smoking and the effects of secondhand smoking inside cars. Obviously, that makes sense inside, uh, you know, some hotels and, and other places, public buildings. We've also raised the age for smoking from 18 to 21. We've tried to limit it in so many different ways. I was proud this year to carry legislation which uh, passed and now it's, it's going to uh, it's going to the uh, state Senate. And my bill simply says, if you live in a condo or an apartment or a townhome, any of those duplexes, any of those places where your residential unit is next to another neighbor's unit and you have a shared wall in between the two of you, whether it's a roof or a floor or a wall, and so you're, you're not a single family home, but you are living in a, a situation where you have people next to you and a neighbor next to you or below you or above you is smoking, especially if the smoke comes, comes through the common areas like balcony, patio, and then maybe common ventilation. There may be some walls that are so thin that the smoke and the toxins still come through. That's a major health concern and not, not to mention just the annoying aspect of it. Under current law in Virginia, it was really hard for somebody to say, hey, I have a neighbor who's smoking, can you do something about it? managers or other condo associations would say, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to do anything. I mean, I know it's a, it's a bit of a pain, but you're just gonna have to live with that. 
we heard complaints over and over and over. So I started to get some looking into it. I work with our housing commission in Virginia. I talked to a lot of legislators and others who have expertise, our, our states, our public health folks and others. And we were able to craft legislation that gives the legal authority for home, homeowners associations, the condo associations, apartment dwellings, office dwellings. Those folks can come together and craft their own rules under their own governing uh, documents to say in our units, we're gonna make this a non-smoking uh, place. And not only on the common premises, but also inside your unit, unless you can put in ventilation and walls and. If you can protect your, your unit so that no smoke ever comes out, then you, fine, you can smoke. But if not, you have to make sure that other people's health is not affected. So that's something that I passed, House Bill uh, 1842. I'm really proud of that. I'm hoping that this becomes law this year to put Virginia further as a leader of uh, the anti-secondhand smoking in the Commonwealth. I have a few other bills, which I don't want to spend too much time talking about my own agenda, but to the extent that it, it overlaps with other uh, people's uh, agendas, and I know the governor is pushing for something like this, that is something that uh, we are gonna be talking about. Uh, one of the, uh, and let me just, since we're talking about smoking, let me just address for just a couple of seconds. I know everybody asks me, when are we gonna legalize pot? <laughs> that is, has been and continues to be one of the first questions I receive. And somehow every time I visit a high school campus or a college campus, I don't know why, but that's the first question that somebody asked me. When's Virginia gonna legalize pot? Well, the answer is we are closer than ever before for adult recreational use. But I don't, I can't tell you whether it's going to pass or not, but that is certainly something that's been teed up this session. We've been talking about doing it for medical purposes before, industrial purposes before, but as a nation, as you probably saw with the election a couple of months ago, a lot of states are now going in that direction and with a, with a Democratic administration in the White House, they may take a different view than the President Trump's administration and the Department of Justice. So if the feds end up reducing the schedule of, of marijuana in the, in the narcotic list, that may actually open up some opportunities at the state level to go with a recreational use. And the other thing the feds have to do is um, allow for the financial services of banks and others to be able to accept cash from sales of marijuana, which is currently under federal law illegal. If they do that, then I think pretty much most states will say, all right, well, we'll go ahead and do that. So Virginia is in this tight spot of wanting to do so because there's a demand, but we also want to do it the right way. Uh, so that will probably happen if not this year, some kind of a study may come out of that. So keep an eye on that. Uh, let me just say on the topic of uh, criminal justice for a little bit, given, given that some of the marijuana issues tend to be seen from a criminal justice angle. Uh, you, you all might remember a few months ago in our nation when we had uh, a number of very tragic incidences that we were able to see with our own eyes, uh, social media, on TV, through news. Uh, Mr. George Floyd was uh, brutally murdered as we saw the situation unfold in, in real time. And of course, we know about Ms. Brianna Taylor and how tragically she was uh, murdered and killed as a bystander in a, in a police uh, search situation. And we could name another 100,000 or more people who've faced similar fates like that with or without video that we've seen. The reality is our nation did suffer uh, recently from, from recognizing the racial inequities, especially in our criminal justice, in our, in our criminal justice system. And uh, what that means is that we in Commonwealth of Virginia wanted to make sure that our criminal justice laws were as fair and equitable as possible. So we spent a lot of time last year during the, after the session was over, during the special session, we passed about a dozen or so different criminal reform, criminal justice reform bills, but clearly we couldn't address all of it uh, in a limited time. And so this year we are gonna see some more criminal justice bills. One of them that is has been teed up and will be considered very seriously in the next couple of weeks is the issue of death penalty. What are we doing about death penalty? Virginia, unfortunately, still has a number of people on death row. And if we don't act, if the current state of the law remains in Virginia, then uh, these two or three uh, inmates will end up facing the ultimate penalty sometime soon. And so we are being asked to consider whether in this day and age in the 21st century America, is death penalty still something that we ought to accept as part of our criminal justice system? Or should we consider either abolishing or, or doing a moratorium or something to say, let's pause and ensure that this is a right uh, part of our judicial system. And uh, I know many of us have different views and very strong uh, emotional views about this. And I know people, I respect everybody's views on every issue that comes up. And I know this is one that's uh, very important for many people. All I can tell you is uh, I, I believe and I think the right thing to do is for us to pause and 
uh, either abolish outright, if there's a way we do that, or, or at, least, at a minimum have a moratorium so that we can ensure that only those that are absolutely 100% certainly uh, guilty are still remaining. And if there's any doubt, especially if the result of that person being on, on death row is a result of racial or uh, equitable, other types of inequitable situations, or there's some kind of a, uh, prejudice or anything else that was involved in that case that we want to address that. And so one way or another, uh, criminal justice reform and death penalty abolishing is going to be on the agenda. I will most likely vote for abolishing, but I just don't know when, where, and how that bill comes up. So I want to make sure you understand those are some of the big things, legalizing marijuana and, and death penalty. Uh, the other things that came up a lot this year uh, is, um, of course, uh, education, schools, and what's going on with our, our kids and our teachers who are uh, virtually learning from home, K through 12, and then even higher education. I've uh, been on the education committee in the house now for a number of years, and the last couple of years, I've had the real privilege of being able to chair the higher education subcommittee, the one that deals with post-secondary education. And we've had at least one meeting, we're gonna have another meeting coming up. And so as somebody who's been on the education committee and, and looking at these issues, both as a state legislator, but also as a stakeholder, having two kids who are, one is still in uh, the K through 12, one just graduated and is in the higher education system of all public schools in, in Vienna. I, uh, I want to make sure that we do right by those students. I let me put it this way. Um, this is a very, very, very big and important issue. There are no easy answers. And I know people have very, very strong views. I've heard from hundreds and thousands of constituents over the last nine months. And this one is really, really tough to solve. I would like to devote the time that it needs, we need to do to make this conversation much more robust and more meaningful. So I, uh, I can't tell you the date because we're still looking at my legislative schedule, but sometime in the next uh, week, week and a half or so, I'm gonna hold another public town hall just like this one, but I'm gonna ask our school board members and other stakeholders, uh, those that have you know, both different views as well as uh, different perspectives on these issues to come together kind of like a public town hall where we can really talk about these issues. What can the federal government do now that we have a new president and he, uh, President Biden is talking about how he wants to open schools as a priority in the new ed education department at the federal level? What can we in the governor's office and our department of education do at the state level, the superintendents? What are the local counties able to do? What do they, or can't they do because of their limitations? The difference between the private schools versus the public schools and how they're dealing with virtual versus in class. Uh, the differences between suburban schools like Northern Virginia and some of the rural areas, uh, especially some of our schools where they already are limited with the funding uh, abilities to, to take care of everything. And of course, it ties in directly with the rapid availability and distribution of vaccines for COVID. So these issues are they deserve more than just a, a you know, fleeting two to three minute conversations today. So I will commit to you that I'm gonna host and I, I invite my good friends who are uh, serving in the uh, school boards in Fairfax and elsewhere. Uh, I, I'm gonna reach out to you and invite you to join me in this conversation. And let me just say on the, for the outset, uh, my, my school board members right here uh, in the town of Vienna and in Providence where I live, uh, Carl Frisch, uh, Melanie Marin, and uh, Laura Jane Cohen, who I, represents another part of my district, as well as all of our at-large school board members, they have done an amazing and outstanding job under some of the most difficult times and the difficult circumstances. Uh, I would hate to be in their position. I guarantee you nobody would like to be in their position because they're, they're making decisions. They're putting in amazingly long hours for absolutely no credit and they're criticized because of the fact that they're trying to address this problem that's very hard to address. So I want to thank them publicly and privately for all the work that they're doing. I'd like to ask them to join me in a conversation so that we can educate our constituents. And uh, the other reason I wanted to wait until maybe another week or so before we have that conversation as a separate public town hall is because frankly, we haven't done a lot yet in the General Assembly. This session, uh, we've seen some bills on education. There's some budget uh, amendments that are floating around, but the House of Delegates has not taken any uh, strong affirmative, uh, very specific action on K through 12 uh, reforms when it comes to COVID yet. We will be doing so in the coming days. And so I think it's better for me to wait a little bit so that we have a sense of what the budget's gonna look like, how much more tools we can provide to our teachers and our, our parents and students before we have the conversation. So uh, enough of that about education, but I do have a couple of bills on education this year, which one's a dealing with student drivers, driving uh, license requirements. Another one is looking at a way to add more transparency and accountability for our colleges and universities as they're dealing with these types of issues. So I've got a couple of those bills that are working through the education committee. And then finally, I'll just tell you a couple of my own uh, bills just so that you can be aware of it. And then I'm, I'm sure I'll be 
responding to more of these questions in the future. And by the way, if you haven't signed up to get my emails, I really hope you do. Just go to uh, dot, 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 I know, www.delegatekeem.org, delegatekeem.org, or you can just go to my name, markkeem.com, and sign up, put in your email for a constituent email. And then I, I send about one, one every couple of days, a few days when I'm in session. I'll probably send one out this afternoon after this is done and send the link to this video so you can see that as well. But please sign up. That way I can tell you about uh, the other work that I'm working on. Uh, so the other bill that's a big, big issue for me and one of my highest priorities this session is one of my very favorite topics. And it has a nice segue from the school, the conversation we just had, which is school buses. As uh, many of you know, we have we have uh, a wonderful school system in Virginia. Our public school system is second to none in the country, but the number of school buses that we have in Virginia is also second to none. Actually, we're second to somebody. We're, we're number two in the country. And so we have more school buses in Virginia than any other, other state. I don't know why. We love those little yellow buses. The problem is, as much as we love those buses, they're old and they're built with fossil fuel. They're built with diesel fuel. So, you know, with all those buses on the road, you got a lot of uh, carbon and uh, other types of benzene and other types of meth. I don't know if it's, I, I'm not good at science either. I'm not good at math or science, so I shouldn't talk uh, science stuff. But there's a lot of bad stuff that come out and it affects the health of both our air as well as like, the kids that are on those buses. And so I've been approached by a number of uh, environmental and parents organizations to say, what can we do about that? So for the last couple of years, we've been looking at a way to electrify school buses from diesel and turn them into electric buses. Just like, you know, it's like, think about, a poor man's Tesla, I guess, <laughs> but a big yellow version of a Tesla. And the idea is to make sure that our school buses could be using as little electricity as possible, uh, little power as possible that comes from carbon emitting sources and instead using cleaner sources. And now that's a heavy lift in terms of trying to get a, a school bus to be converted. But the good news is technology is available and there are models out there. Uh, our, the governor has already been working with our school boards. I know Fairfax County has just recently partnered with one of the utility companies to do that. So it is possible. There is technology, it's feasible. The cost is obviously gonna come down at some point. So I put in a bill last couple of years to see if we can create a state fund that would electrify school buses. Uh, that bill is gonna be going through the process as we speak. And so I'm working on it now, but that's that's one of my highest priorities. I wanna thank in particular, the parents of uh, Vienna schools who've approached me to talk to me about that and uh, groups like Mothers Out Front and all the other environmental organizations that have been pushing for that. Uh, we can talk more about those uh, environmental agenda in, 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 a, in another part of the conversation. So it's now about 1.30. Uh, I have two guests that are gonna be joining me at 1.45, so in about 15 minutes. And I am really honored that they, have, they found the time to join me because as you can imagine, uh, not only are our essential workers and frontline uh, health workers just working around the clock to stop us from being further impacted by COVID, but our officials who work at the Virginia Department of Health our county departments of health and all of our local counties and those that are in the front lines in the hospitals are literally working overtime. Every single mo uh, awakening moment of their day, they are spending on dealing with uh, COVID. And now that the vaccine is available and is beginning to be distributed, disseminated around the country, they are doing their utmost best to make sure that you're, you are in the queue to be able to receive that vaccine if you want that vaccine. And uh, so let me spend in that about 10 minutes or so before we have Dr. Uh, Danny Avula and uh, Colin, uh, Brody from, Colin Brody from the Fairfax County. They're, they're ones from the state, ones from the county. I'll, I'll introduce them properly when they're here. But before the two gentlemen uh, join us to answer questions and provide uh, the latest on what's going on with our coordination on vaccines, let me just make sure that you know uh, what the basics are and frankly, uh, I'm learning this myself, okay? So don't, don't think that I have all the answers because I do not. I'm learning a lot of this stuff just from public sources that I'm, I'm researching myself. I'm also learning a lot of this from, from the uh, information that I'm getting from experts. I have been asking around here and there and I've, I did have a chance to talk to uh, uh, Dr. Daniel Bullitt the other day, but the information that he's sharing is now pretty much the same public information that he told me and so I'm just another citizen who is interested, just like you, who doesn't have any medical or healthcare background. I have no expertise in medicine or healthcare or sciences. I'm just an interested citizen who wants to know the best. And clearly the first question is, when am I gonna get my vaccine? But beyond that question, it's what is going on and how are things working? And where are some problems that we as citizens ought to know about so that when my neighbor says, hey, how come I'm not getting my vaccine? Or if, if uh, somebody tells me, you know, I went to CVS and I, I can't get in line to get a vaccine, 
at least we'll have some understanding of what's going on. So let me try my best. And again, I am not the expert. I'm going to try my best to share what I understand to be the case here. And then as I do that, my, my able assistant will tell me when the two gentlemen are ready to join us in this room and then we'll, we'll introduce them. So uh, let me take a quick uh, glass of water here. So I think it's really important for us when we have this conversation about vaccines and especially you know, about COVID generally to put this in context. And I know all of us are guilty of having short-term memory. Uh, I certainly do. It's incredible to think that one year ago, exactly one year ago, January of 2020, nobody was talking about COVID other than maybe a few healthcare professionals Obviously, in overseas where the countries were being impacted, they were talking about it in a more broader way. But at least in America, I, I remember because I was in the General Assembly a year ago and people heard, yeah, there's some virus going around and some people are being hurt in Asia and other places. But I don't think anybody was sitting there thinking, how's that going to affect me in the town of Vienna? How's it going to affect Virginians? Is that going to shut down our schools? Is it going to shut down our economy? Are we going to have millions of people losing their jobs? Stock market going to crash? I don't think anybody anticipated that just a year ago. And yet, here we are within that one year, we not only had a global pandemic of a magnitude we haven't seen in at least a hundred years, but even more crazy than that is the fact that as horrible and as tragic as it has taken nearly 400,000 American lives, millions of people's lives around the country and thousands of people every day being affected. Now today, I think it's like 4,000 Americans are gonna die every single day. We went from a crisis where nobody even knew what COVID meant and how it was even infectious to now having a vaccine that is 95% successful. That is unheard of. And I've talked to a number of experts who say this has never been done before in history. It probably can't be done again because the amount of focus that people put together. And I want to give credit where credit is due, but I also want to make sure that the facts are clear. I give President Donald Trump some credit for recognizing the need for the federal government to put some money into vaccine research as soon as possible. So he and his administration said, let's take some of the uh, risks that could possibly be assumed by private sector. They'll never willingly risk billions and trillions of dollars, but if the federal government will take that risk, maybe that'll expedite the production of vaccines before there's even a test going on, before the scientific evidence is out there. So that administration did something good in terms of vaccines by saying the federal government will own the risk and allow for these companies like Moderna, uh, uh, Pfizer, AstraZeneca, and all the other companies to start thinking, researching, production, doing the testing as soon as possible. So that was a good thing. The same administration though, however, did I think something that is uh, unforgivable, which is to say, yeah, sure, we're gonna create the vaccine, but while the vaccine is being created, we're gonna pretend like COVID is not a big deal. We're gonna call it a hoax. We're gonna say this is some kind of a nefarious thing. Masks don't work. Social distancing is some kind of a social agenda by the liberals. And I'm not gonna wear masks anywhere. And you know, patriotic, patriotic thing to do is to express our liberty and such. And so by expressing the wrong public message at the same time that they were doing something positive, unfortunately put us in the circumstance today where Americans are still very much torn about this issue. And you all saw what happened over the last few months where people still fight with each other whether you should wear a mask or not. So I really regret, and I'm sorry that that happened in the last administration. I don't want to point fingers or blame anybody. What I want to do is move forward from where we are, the Commonwealth of Virginia, what you and I can do as citizens, and with the new administration that just started in Washington just this week, how do we ensure that we take whatever circumstances we have now and turn it into a positive roadmap so that every American is vaccinated as soon as possible and practical. So that's what I want to focus on. But let's also acknowledge that when we have questions to our amazing uh, leaders here from the, the county and from the state, when we ask them questions, and I, rightfully so, we should be critical when there's some things to be critical about, rightfully so, but let's also understand some of the questions that you have for them are completely outside of their control because of what happened in the last nine months. The federal government has to provide us the vaccines. They have to provide us the ability for us to get that information and the, and the products first before the state and the county can work on it. So I just want to understand that just because uh, our county and the state can't do all the things that we would like them to see is not because they're not doing something right. It's because they're given a bad hand to start with. So that's as, as far as I want to go uh, looking backwards and, and trying to you know, at least set the circumstance. Now, going forward, we have at least one gentleman here who's going to join me very soon. But going forward, let me just kind of explain to you um, how I believe that things are happening. 
so once this federal government, CDC and Health and Human uh, Resources, everybody else is doing the stockpiling and all the vaccine stuff, once they've uh, cleared that, the FDA approves uh, the testing and what have you, then they basically allocate to each of the 50 states and the territories however much vaccines that we are allocated based on population, et cetera, needs and such. So Virginia receives our, our package, like our, our uh, uh, quota, if you will, our, our allotment. And then when we get that at the state level, our state Department of Health, through Dr. Daniel Vula now, who's the coordinator, but obviously the governor and his team, they then work with all the local governments in our state and all the various counties, towns, cities, et cetera. And they say, okay, what do you need? What do you need? And population needs, you know, obviously you got different types of uh, people that live there in terms of age and type of jobs that they have. And so they'll look through all that and say, okay, Fairfax County, you're gonna get X number. Arlington County, you're gonna get X number. Galax or Halifax or Newport News, you're gonna get this much. So the state's job is to ensure that as soon as that supply is ready for Virginia, that it is allocated and distributed to those places where the actual people like you and I live. And then the state also obviously working with the federal government provides the criteria by which people will receive this. Now, could you imagine a scenario where we said, okay, we have a million doses, the first million people in Virginia who show up at this whatever place, you're gonna get it. It, it. That would be a completely impossible task. We have to prioritize. And the way the federal experts working with our state and our county experts, what they came up with is a system that says, we'll go on in an orderly fashion. So you have phase one, phase one is divided into three parts. So you got phase one, one A, one B, one C, and then phase two. And so that's kind of how they're rolling this out. And it's classic uh, government bureaucrats too. Instead of just saying phase one, two, three, four, five, six, they have one, one A, one A has separate subparts, one B has nine subparts, one C. It's a little bit confusing, but hey, you know, just go with it, all right? So that's how they're doing it. One A, one B, one C. Right now, we are in 1A in Fairfax and 1B as well, because 1A is not completely exhausted. So we're in 1A and 1B. And I, I, we have experts to tell you exactly what that means. But 1A is basically people who are uh, uh, in the senior citizens and nursing homes, places where we've seen, unfortunately, the most severe numbers and, and the intensity of, of deaths from COVID. So, and the people that work there, obviously, because they're the ones that are taking care of our, our uh, people that are, are infected. So 1A was clearly from that category. And then 1B includes people of certain age, 75 and then 65 now, as well as frontline workers like hospitals, of course, and uh, nurses, as well as ambulances and firefighters, police, et cetera. And then you go down to teachers and so on and so on. So once you exhaust 1B, then we go to 1C, which has different categories. That sounds all great in, in terms of a plan in writing, but when you try to administer it, you're going to need to stand up a program that never existed before. I mean, we're all used to getting flu shots, go down to CVS or wherever and get your flu shot from your doctor once a year. We've been doing that for decades. But uh, this, distributing a vaccine with a priority in such a way that we've never done before is very hard. And the other problem that this is unlike a flu shot, where just about anybody can make flu shots quickly they, if they plan a year in advance, here, there's only two, right now, there are only two sources. That's a company called Pfizer, a company called Moderna. They're the only ones that are physically able to produce this because of the FDA um, uh, ruling and such. There's a third company, AstraZeneca, that's coming down the pike. But by the time we get those three up and running, they can only physically make as many doses as possible. So what President Biden is doing is uh, engaging the defense, authorizing uh, you know, the Defense Production Act to allow for the federal government to encourage and create more of these doses as soon as possible. But even that, there's going to be a physical limitation. There comes a point where there's physically not enough vaccines. So once the, the vaccines are given to us, then we allocate that and make sure that people have it in their arms. That is the toughest nut to crack here. How do we ensure that people get it? And how do we ensure it's orderly? And of course, it's got to be fair as well and transparent. So that's the part that we don't have as many answers because I'm just the lay person here. So what I'd like to do is ask our, uh, I, I know we have a Mr. Brody here joining us and then Dr. Avila will join us. Uh, Janine, can you let uh, Mr. Brody in to this, the room so we can have a conversation together? And then I'd like to introduce uh, this amazing public servant. Uh, hello, uh, Mr. Brody, can I call you Colin? Yes, please do. Okay, Colin, it's good to see you. Thank you for joining me. I really, really appreciate you making time. I know you are on the front, literally on the front lines. And so for you taking a half an hour to speak with me and my constituents is a true, true public service. So let me, uh, before I turn to you, I just want to tell folks, uh, Colin is the uh, Assistant Public Health Emergency Management Coordinator with the Fairfax County Health Department's Office of Emergency Preparedness and Response. 
Whew, that's a long, long name. But the good thing is he doesn't have to put that on his uh, business card because he just shows up and does his work. He's not, the, he's not like me where I just walk around with business cards. This guy actually goes out and helps people directly. So uh, just know that he is, uh, we are blessed to have him. Thank you. So uh, my first question to you, Colin, is, um, and just kind of a gen general question is, how long have you been in this role right now that you're doing as, as part of our uh, vaccine coordinator? How, how long have you been doing what you're doing? Well, we activated about a year ago for the COVID response, um, and I've been involved in that response since the beginning. Um, we began vaccinating in late December, right around Christmas, um, but we began planning, and I was involved in the planning effort over the summer. Um, so we started ordering supplies. We started um, mapping out staffing and, and various contingency planning um, well before vaccine was even um, through phase two trials. Um, and so I've, you know, been involved. It's certainly a team effort. Um, there are approximately 560 health department staff that um, are involved on our COVID response. And then we have a number of volunteers who assist. So um, I'm just one of many um, involved in this effort. Okay. And then uh, just level saying, just so that people understand, and then we'll get into more specifics. Uh, everybody knows that Fairfax County is the largest county in the Commonwealth, uh, by far. I mean, we don't even com come close to the second and third. And so you obviously have a much bigger role because of our county being so big. Are you, how much are you hearing and coordinating with other counties, say Arlington or Alexandria, Loudoun, Prince William, as well as you know, other parts? How much is, is what you're doing in Fairfax similar or different because of the fact that we are so uniquely big? I think you, you pointed out the main difference, which is just the the magnitude of a response in a county the size of Fairfax is going to be um, far and beyond that of other counties in Virginia. And so this is something that we, we are used to. Um, we are staffed appropriately and we have um, the resources. We're very fortunate to have um, the county support us, you know, year over year, not just during pandemic. So we were positioned very well, but as you can imagine, when you have 1.2 million people in our health district and just for um, for awareness that Fairfax County Health Department, even though our name is Fairfax County, um, we are the health department for more than just that political jurisdiction. So we cover the city of Fairfax, the county of Fairfax, the towns of Herndon and Vienna, and then we also um, cover the city of Falls Church. So we have 1.2 million people in our health district and obviously um, we are working on behalf of all of them, uh, not only for vaccine, but we are also running concurrent um, disease containment and, and investigation um, seven days a week. Yeah, yeah, that's, I, I wanted to make sure that we started with that conversation because uh, I, I, I live in Fairfax myself, obviously, I, and I, my legislative district is only Fairfax County, so I have no other jurisdictions to compare. The town of Vienna is in my district, but that's uh, very similar in terms of what we do. And the reason I want to start there is because I think a lot of my, my constituents that I've talked to over the last uh, few months who are Fairfax County residents are just seeing what Fairfax is doing. And for good or for bad, they see the flaws and problems with Fairfax, not recognizing that there are other counties that are doing much better because they're smaller, <laughs> they're easier to manage, not recognizing that there are other places where there are just more tools that are available given the population. So I wanna start with that level set because Fairfax County is very unique in many, many ways. So I wanna thank you for that. Now I see Dr. Uh, Danny Avila just joined us and I wanna thank you, uh, doctor. So. Uh, let, let's bring, uh, Janine, do, do we have Dr. Avila on screen? Oh, great, wonderful. So uh, first of all, uh, doctor, uh, thank you. I, I've seen you probably like four or five times just this week alone, at least virtually. And I know that you haven't slept at all because um, I've seen you at different hours of the day and night and uh, the work that you're doing is just incredible. Let me just explain for my, my constituents who are watching this and this will be obviously recorded and, and provided later too. So for, for folks that might be joining later, I just wanna make sure I explain. I, I mentioned that Mr. Brody's background is our Fairfax County public health official, but Dr. Avula is, has, right now he's wearing a couple of different hats. He is of course a medical doctor himself, uh, specializing in uh, pedi pediatric work, which uh, is just like our governor. He's, he's been an expert on that, but he has a, a variety of different backgrounds as far as being a medical expert. He also has uh, an uh, MPH among other many, many different degrees. But uh, for our purposes, he was until uh, about what, two weeks ago, he was a full-time head of the uh, Richmond City and Henrico County Public Health Department. So he already had his arms and hands full just managing that locality. But because he's such an amazing leader, the governor said, hey, 
come on over. We need you. The extra three hours of the day that you're not sleeping, you know. And so he is now the statewide vaccine coordinator, which is a job that I don't know if anybody can ever be paid enough to do that. But unfortunately for us, uh, we uh, we couldn't hire you know more people into Virginia from other places, so we had to look within. And of course, there's nobody better who can do this job than Dr. Abula. Uh, he comes with a long history of working on these areas, and right now for the next uh, couple three months, his goal is to stand up the uh, the program at the state level. And, I, and, and Dr. and also uh, Colin, before you join, I try to level set a little bit about where we have been. I mean, clearly since last year when we we didn't even have a a uh, disease, let alone a vaccine, to where we are, some of the flaws and problems that we have from the federal side, and not to blame, blame or finger point, the reality is you were starting with a bad hand. It wasn't like you were given the perfect hand. You were starting with a bad hand to start with because of the lack of federal coordination. But over the last few weeks, clearly we are all getting adjusted to the, the new reality. So the only responsibility that you have, uh, Danny, and then you have, Colin, is taking this facts of today and making sure that today and tomorrow and going forward, Virginia does absolutely the best that we need to make, make sure that the 8.5 million Virginians in their due course receives their vaccine. So uh, let me start with you, uh, Dr. Vula. I, we, Colin and I just had a quick conversation about Fairfax County, but uh, let me ask you uh, just kind of a general conversation. I know you just gave a presentation uh, yesterday, the day before to the Appropriations Committee. We've also had several conversations and, and I appreciate how you explain the phases, and clearly there are many, many, many things we could be doing, and we should be doing all of it at the same time, but from a leadership perspective, you are trying to prioritize so that the first thing we do is, to the extent vaccines come to Virginia, and to the extent that it's actually being administered where people are being shot, there is a gap, just because the logistics, right? You got a bunch coming to state, a bunch that are going to the arms, and then a bunch somewhere in between, whether it's in a truck, in a refrigerator, it might be sitting there, people are being made appointments for, but not showing up yet. So there is that gap that uh, I think you call that the gap that we're trying to fill. That's the first priority is to ensure that we don't have as much of a gap between the time it comes to our state and the time it's administered. And then the second part of your priority, the kind of like a second phase, is looking at the idea that uh, once we have the vaccines and available, how do we ensure that more people are getting it at the same time? So we're not just saying, hey, go online, make an appointment and wait your turn. It's, what other ways we could do? Do we do masks? Do we do other pods? And you can explain all this stuff. Just making sure that it's distributed as quickly as possible in a systematic way. And then the final part of that, of course, is once we get that up and running, once we have those mechanisms in place and all the units are running the way it should, then we got to up our game. We got to make sure that more vaccines are coming from feds. So we fight like heck to make sure that the federal government gives us. We make sure AstraZeneca and others are stood up so that they're creating more vaccines. And we hit that magic sweet spot of what I believe is what 50,000 per week. That'll get us to you know half of, half of our population uh, by a certain date and so on. So if we want to talk about it from that perspective, do you want to kind of uh, tell us where things are, where you see some needs, and most importantly, what my constituents and others need to know about uh, you know what you're planning so that they're always thinking ahead as opposed to being frustrated. Yeah, absolutely, Delegate Kim. I, I just need to say, I literally have never had anybody listen to a presentation and be able to digest and repeat it as well as you just did. So thank you for that. It's really heartening to know that people are listening. Um, I've got I've a couple of times to listen to you, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you've had three shots. All right, I got, I got it. <laughs> Um, well, I should also tell you all, I'm a child of, of Fairfax County, grew up in, in the Northern Virginia area, went to TJ, love that place, uh, but have been in Richmond for the last 20 years or so. Um, let me get kind of just lay out a couple of things on here uh, that, that line up perfectly with what Delegate Keem just shared. Um, let me, um, okay, so I, I think that, uh, so let's start with where we are today. Uh, if you look at our public facing dashboard on the VDH website, you'll see that we're just over 1 million doses uh, distributed into Virginia and 443,000 doses that have been administered and showing up in our system. And that showing up in our system is a really important piece of this because we have been using something called the Virginia Immunization Information System, VIZ. It's our state immunization database. We've used it for years very reliably. Uh, most of the electronic medical records for hospitals and doctor's offices are linked to it. Um, and so that is where if anybody gets immunized, the, the link to VIZ then, then comes back out and tells us how many we've actually administered here, this 443. Now there is a little bit of a delay, a little bit of a lag. And what we have found as we've done a deeper dive is that that, uh, that gap is actually not just 
the expected delay, but a lot of other mismatches as the as the rollout of you know federal registration systems and different platforms have been used for for this mass vaccination effort. And I'll I'll di dive a little deeper on that. But th this just tells you kind of where we're at today, and and hopefully what you see is you know when we look at the last week, um, we we really have seen multiple days where we've had over uh, you know 22, 26,000 doses a day, um, and and I think this little gap we're seeing here, there's a, there's a couple of data issues because I think we consistently have done over 20,000 days of the day. Our seven day rolling average is just under that and, and reflects, you know, kind of getting to the goal we need to get to. But those three phases, close the gap. We got to figure out how do we accurately tell the story of where the doses are and ensure that they're getting into individuals. Manage the current scenario, which is a really challenging supply and demand gap. And then the third phase, how do we build the infrastructure for the future? So as we look to close that gap, here's what we're looking at. Just over a million distributed, 443 administered. Now, about 80,000 of those doses are just this data disconnect. You know, some hospitals were using, um, instead of using their EMRs, which talk to VIZ, they use their occupational health platforms, which don't have that VIZ link. Um, some places out in the, the more rural parts of the state were doing paper registration. And while they were so focused on getting vaccines and arms, they did not allocate staff to do the manual data entry you have to do when, when you've got paper registration. So at the, uh, in the middle of this week, we formed a team of folks who got trained and got access to that VIZ database. They were dispatched to local health departments to just go and crank out that manual data entry. Um, and, and really, I think this 80,000 dose disconnect, I think that's going to be addressed over the course of the next few days. I expect to see a flood of new uh, vaccine administered come in uh, in the next few days. Now, a big chunk of this is actually what's set aside for our long-term care uh, facility work. So remember, Group 1A was healthcare workers, but also nursing homes, assisted living facilities, their resident and staff. You know, and we did that because th that's where we've seen uh, COVID just absolutely devastate communities, and and those folks needed to be at the top of our list. The federal government plan to address that was to contract CVS and Walgreens to provide. Uh, vaccines directly to go out into those nursing homes and assisted living facilities and vaccinate their staff and their residents. Now, a total of 226,000 doses were allocated for that specific purpose. To date, CVS and Walgreens have done about 60,000. Uh, they plan, they're, they, they're telling us that they can get through all of the uh, skilled nursing facilities and assisted living facilities by the end of January. We are gonna have to look at how do we not only augment that so that we can get to that incredibly vulnerable population sooner, but also so that we don't still see this, this huge gap of doses that have been allocated to the pharmacies. So we're, uh, we've been on the phone with state leadership this week. We're looking at other ways, whether that's using their allocation to, uh, to, to spread out and vaccinate other um, facilities that may not fall into that skilled nursing facility or assisted living facility category. For example, independent senior living, right? Like, there's a number of communities around the country that aren't licensed facilities, don't require nursing care, but still have sort of congregate aspects with vulnerable elderly individuals. And so how do we allocate vaccine to make sure that those communities are prioritized in the next couple of weeks? And then a big part of the gap is the, the, the allocations that went out to health systems across the state. Remember 1A was healthcare workers. And so many, many, many doses, hundreds of thousands of doses went to health systems. Now, some health systems were incredibly agile with that, were able to scale up, mass vaccinate, get through their staff quickly. And if you look at our data, you'll see that almost uh, maybe more at this point, 200,000 of the 440,000 that we vaccinated were healthcare workers. And that's in large part due to our hospital and health systems. But there was also some confusion about the second dose uh, distribution. And so I think giving all these mixed messages from the federal government, a lot of our health systems were like, we need to hold on to some of these doses to make sure that our folks get their second doses. We're not sure if it's going to come. Uh, and so we need to schedule those appointments now. So there's a, there's a large amount, over 100,000 of these doses that are spoken for in the sense that they're, um, that they're committed to second dose appointments. And I think we've got to do a better job of telling that story to Virginia. I was looking at New York's website yesterday and they have really clearly split out. First doses distributed, first doses administered, second doses distributed, second doses administered. And I think that kind of granularity may help Virginians not just think we've got a 
567,000 dose gap, what's going on? Why is there so much vaccine out there and I can't get one? but really helps people understand that this is where the vaccine is, it's accounted for, um, and then helps us move to the second phase of the issue, which is really- Dr. Dr. Yeah, so let me let me ask a question about that particular point, because I think yeah. this is important, and I want to bring uh, Colin into this. Uh, so just, just to make sure that we understand the facts, uh, when we say first dose and second dose, even though we're saying, you know, like everybody needs to get two shots, they're the exact same chemical makeup, right? It's not like there's one version and then part two is a different version. It's just the same thing. You just get it twice. Is that is that true? That's exactly right. Uh, it's the same. It's the same vaccine, but the logistics distribution model is different for them. Okay. So the way the federal government is operating is that every every place that receives a, a first dose vaccine will automatically have a second dose allocation at a three or four week interval, depending on what the brand of vaccine is. Okay, but so, so to uh, Colin, how is Fairfax County doing that? What's our policy, as, as doctor just said, you know, there's some places that are saying, yeah, we have, let's say we have a hundred thousand, but half of that we're saving for later. Therefore we can't really count that as distributed now. What's Fairfax's role? What are you doing about that? So as Dr. Bula said, uh, we have operated on the assumption that we would be getting um, federally backed second doses. So we have been treating every dose that has come to us um, over the last four weeks as a first dose, a viable first dose. And so we were um, previously receiving only Moderna. And so essentially what we were doing is we knew it was a, for Moderna, it's a four week, 28 day interval. So we looked at the calendar. We said, if we give 600 today, four weeks from today, we are going to give 600 that we don't have on our shelves right now, but we are promised those um, through the Operation Warp Speed. Um, and so we have not been holding any in reserve. Um, what we do is basically, based on the number of vaccines inbound, we release that number of appointments in our scheduling system. Um, or in a couple of cases, for example, our public safety folks go through an occupational health center. We do a redistribution. So we work with the state to um, get it approved. And we then transfer kind of in, in mass um, 1,000 or 2,000 doses to them. And then they distribute on their own. And they enter, as Dr. Valu was saying, they hand enter into Viz. So for them, there might be a two-day delay in between when the vaccine was administered and when it gets entered into Viz because the same nurses vaccinating are the same ones entering. So um, we've, we've worked to streamline that and make sure that it's 24 hours or less, uh, but that's how we're handling it. And before the doctor goes back to his presentation, just two more quick things, just to make sure people understand what the facts are. Uh, my understanding is that currently there are two, uh, you know, Pfizer and Moderna available. Uh, once you take a Pfizer first dose, you have to stay with a Pfizer second dose and vice versa. You cannot mix and match, right? That's absolutely true, right? Okay, that, that is true. And then the last part of this question, just to make sure that we, we get some facts out there is, uh, if, if, um, if a person receives a first dose, so he or she is good for a little bit, at least three weeks or four weeks, and before they come back for the second dose, if it turns out that say, you know, the Biden administration or somebody makes a decision, you know what? I'd rather get as many of the first doses out there as possible. So even if we have saved the second dose for this person who just got their first dose, as a policy matter, we think it's better to get this second dose to somebody else, give that person first. I know we had some conversations. Where is Virginia on that? Are we making any decisions that would impact that? Um, yeah, I think there's been a lot of debate whether uh, or not we should widely distribute first doses. And I think as long as the federal guidance from the FDA and CDC remains, hey, we're going to prioritize second doses, which is currently their state, um, th then we will follow suit. You know, if there is a federal designation that says, okay, we, we're going to run with the 60 to 70% protection you get from a first dose, that, then we may shift gears then. But at this point, we're really prioritizing second doses. Okay. Well, that's good. And, okay, go ahead. I think you're in the middle of your presentation. Oh, no, no problem. Um, okay, so let's let's talk about kind of where we are, where, where we're at now, which is really managing this challenging supply demand gap. So, um, uh oh. All right, so I want to show you this, uh, and I, we, we have this broken down by uh, locality or health district, and we'll start to to, put, to include that as part of our public facing dashboard. But I think it's really important for people to recognize just like the raw numbers we're working with because it, it does start to change the context and change the expectation of how quickly we'll move through 1B. So every week at this point, and, and what we anticipate for the next four to eight weeks is that we are getting a total, when you add up Moderna and Pfizer, a total of 105,000 new doses a week for the entire state. 
So what we have moved to this week is a geographic per capita distribution where each health district and locality gets kind of their share of that 105,000. Uh, and so as you, as you break it out by region, you know, you guys in Northern Virginia are the, are the most densely populated, but still that's 22,000 doses that's got to be spread across Fairfax, Arlington, Alexandria, Loudoun, and Prince William, 22,000 doses a week. And so it, it just like, I, I want to put numbers to it because I think there's so many people who are finding themselves in this 1B, right? They're teachers, they're 65 and over, they're grocery store workers, and they're like, it's 1B, how do I get vaccinated? And, and I think one of the take home messages for folks to understand is that 1, 1A and 1B together constitute almost 50% of Virginia. And so if, if this is the vaccine supply chain that we have right now, it's gonna take a year really to get through that population. Now, hopefully vaccine supply will increase and hopefully that'll happen quickly. So we really are still, um, mobilizing to vaccinate all of Virginia by the summer, but it is so dependent on federal vaccine supply right now. And so I think that, you know, as we think about, you know, what this 1B is, uh, this was the guidance, it's, again, it's on our state health department website. What health departments have been charged to do is work in two parallel tracks. One track to really focus on 65 and up and those with underlying conditions and to try to create pods and opportunities for that segment of the population to get vaccinated. Remember, again, that's a huge segment of our population. And then the second parallel track is to work through these essential worker groups in order. And so they, so getting with our police, getting with our corrections, getting with our teachers and setting up those opportunities at, at, for each community. Um, and that's, that's the goal. It has, it's, some of that has happened out of order. Some of it for efficiency sake has combined some of those groups, but this is what we're trying to get health departments to do. And so again, when you think about just a few thousand doses per locality per week, it's going to take a really long time. And I, and I think we've got to do a better job at the state level of, of clearly defining what this order is going to be, clearly communicating to the public at large, like, hey, if you're in manufacturing or if you're a public transit worker, yes, you're an essential part of our workforce. Given the current vaccine supply, it may be two to three months before we get to those closed pods. And so I expect this week we will hear uh, you know, more of that firm and clear guidance because I know that that has been a challenge for so many uh, individuals in our community. Um, so I'll pause there and, and see what other questions come up. Well, great. Yeah, so we did receive a number of questions uh, currently through Facebook Live as well, some pe uh, people that contacted us earlier. And uh, I'm going to try to do, I, I know you've already covered a number of questions, but I'm going to try to uh, ask a couple of questions that will uh, get both uh, you and Colin to, to answer. Uh, one question that came up is, I mean, obviously, you know, we, we have to look at the numbers and statistics because we need data to understand whether we're doing a good job or a bad job. And um, data can tell you a lot of things. And as you just presented, uh, doctor, it's the numbers on the screen don't really mean a whole lot until you realize that means in my neighborhood, we're getting 22,000, 22, literally, out of a million people. So I don't care if we have 100,000, I don't care if we have a million doses in Virginia, but if Fairfax is only allocated 22,000, that tells me I got to wait a long time, right? So uh, is there some way that in terms of the numbers, unless the federal government provides us more, is there any way that our numbers go from 22 to something else? I mean, is there... What, what, what should we be waiting for? Yeah, a couple pathways. So one, you know, the Biden administration has come in and they've said 100 million doses in 100 days. Uh, two, I think two primary pathways. One is to, to fund and increase the production from Pfizer and Moderna. So uh, just building more of a footprint for, for manufacturing for those two companies. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't have any clarity into how that's happening or when it's happening, uh, but, but that increasing production is clearly part of it. The second is the addition of new vaccine candidates uh, into the mix. So both AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson are in the final stages of their clinical trials. Uh, once they get through clinical trials and aggregate the, their data and get it to the, to the FDA, um, they will then seek uh, emergency use authorization, just like Pfizer and Moderna have. And so based on that data, based on you know, any side effects that they're seeing, the FDA will have to make a determination. And if that happens, uh, and, and it should happen, I mean, AstraZeneca is using, used widely in other parts of the world, United Kingdom, Brazil, Australia. So um, that, that likely, you know, I, I think the earliest that could come is probably end of March or the beginning of April. Dr. Fauci said, we're talking weeks, not months. So, so you know, that, that, that's all we really have at this point. Uh, I, I do have a question for uh, Colin in, in a second, but just staying on the numbers, uh, just to make sure that we button this up. 
this is a question that I really don't like, and, and no, no, nothing against the person who asked because this is a legitimate question. It's just I don't like this because a que we've had a, a weeks long debate on this House floor <laughs> between uh, the two political parties about who should be blamed for this, and the question is why or why is not Virginia leading? Why you know in terms of compared to other states, and depending on how you look at the numbers, we're either on the top of we're doing well for a population of a certain size, and then the other way is like no, we're actually doing really horribly. I personally don't really care one way or another because we're talking about what does Virginia have and what can we control for our people? But just a quick thing. I mean, how do you want to talk about the rankings? I mean, this is the thing that everybody wants to know. How is Virginia doing relative to other states? You referenced New York earlier. Clearly, there are things we can do better. But is there some national standard number that tells us how well we're doing relative to other states? Yeah, well, the, the court of public opinion right now is being driven largely by the New York Times and Bloomberg and some of these other outlets that have put up national rankings. That data is being drawn from the CDC. We actually have a meeting tomorrow with the head epidemiologist that's defining how the CDC is actually getting their numbers. Because if you go to the CDC dashboard, they're about 120,000 behind our administration numbers. So there's some catching up we've got to do, and, and, and we're going to advocate and lobby to make sure that that is uh, accurately represented. Because because I think being at the bottom of a ranking list hurts us. It, it, it uh, you know, it leads to distrust and confusion in our community. Um, so, you know, what, what the numbers are showing right now is that if you look at just total doses administered, the, the volume of vaccine that has come into our community, um, Virginia is right around 10 or 11. It changes every day, but we're really near the top of the pack. When you look at the, vol the, the percentage, so the doses distributed over the doses allocated, um, we are near the bottom. I mean, we were at 49 yesterday. I don't know what we are today, but, uh, but that I think is a lot of what is, is creating confusion and frustration. And hopefully what I, what I laid out for you in terms of the gap uh, explains some of that, but we've got to get better data quality. And, and the last thing I'll say about that is that the distributed model of having vaccine in so many different outlets all over the, the state has actually made made data collection and data quality much more complicated. When you look at states that have done a, a really good job, they either have much smaller populations like West Virginia and North Dakota, or Texas, which had a very centralized 20 mass sites able to control sort of the distribution and administration and the data input, um, they, they, they're at like 50 to 60% administered. And so, you know, in, in hindsight, I think there's some things that we may have done differently, but we're still getting a ton of vaccine out there. Well, yeah, like I said, I mean, I, I don't like to dwell on the, the rankings too much because frankly, you know, there's plenty of time for after action review, plenty of time. You know, a year from now, we can go back and say the next pandemic, let's be more prepared. Absolutely. But right now you're building an air, airline jet that's uh, you know, taken off. And so we got to make sure we do what we can with what we have. Uh, Colin, on, on the county part of this, the, the question, and it relates to this idea of getting the distribution out. What is the current lag time right now between the time that somebody goes online and, you know, let's say somebody is qualified either 1A or 1B. They go online, they want to get one from the county as opposed to a private doctor or something like that. They log in, they want to get the appointment. What's the first appointment they can get right now? I think I'll answer that in, in two different ways, um, both kind of at a, a higher level about numbers and then at a technical level about how our appointment system works here at okay. Fairfax. So we have right now about 112,000 people who have submitted registration forms to our system indicating interest in receiving vaccine. Uh, we know that within that 112,000, there are people who may have submitted to us and also uh, gone to ANOVA, or they may have gotten it through their employer and never deleted out of the system or called us just to say they don't need it. But for planning purposes, we know that we have almost 10% of our population already on our wait list. Um, and at the rate that we receive vaccine, as Dr. Vula pointed out, it's going to take us time to get through that backlog. Um, and so we are working to distribute every vaccine we receive um, as quickly as we can, but recognizing that because of our population, we have um, you know, a huge number of people waiting. In terms of when you get an appointment, so I mentioned before, when we find out how much vaccine we're receiving for the week ahead, we release those appointments in our scheduling system. So when someone goes online, what they are doing is they are telling us that I would like, I would like to receive the vaccine here are the answers to my medical screening questions, here's my contact information, and we tell them we will follow up with you when we have vaccine in our stockpile or close to it um, to be able to distribute to you. And then they receive a link and they complete and select an actual appointment time. So we never schedule more than a week in advance because we don't know how much vaccine we're gonna have. And we made a policy decision that we would rather 
be upfront and transparent that we can't guarantee vaccine beyond a week, um, rather than offer people an appointment for a vaccine that is on a spreadsheet but may not actually um, arrive. So different jurisdictions have done it different ways and then had to cancel people um, and tell them there's no vaccine. We, um, for better or for worse, are just, I am personally of the opinion that this is a more transparent way to do it. We collect your information and then we contact you when we know that we have a vaccine on our shelf or on a truck to our shelves. Oh, Delegate Kim, I think you're on mute. Yeah, and so I know that, just a quick follow-up on that. I know that uh, the first few days when you were rolling this out and standing up the website and, and all that, you're getting thousands of calls per minute. And, and I was actually trying to make some calls on behalf of constituents and I was stuck in that too. So I understand that that's, that always happens. Uh, but how are we now? I mean, are you learning every single day? Is your technology getting better? Your phone system, your, your customer service, is that getting better every day? It is. Um, as So basically what we saw was when we only had the phone line, um, we were receiving inbound calls in the tens of thousands per segment of the day. And so it was it was getting overloaded and people were experiencing long wait times. Um, and obviously that's not what we what we wanted. So our IT folks worked night and day literally to bring up a an online portal that people can register. And so right now what we have is both an online registration option um, as that is going to be the fastest way to give us your information. Um, but if you don't have a computer or you're not comfortable with it, uh, they can always call us. And we have a public call center that operates seven days a week. Um, actually, we have two. We have one that handles COVID-related inquiries that are not vaccine. And then we have a larger call center um, that handles only vaccine. And so any, anytime someone reaches out uh, seven days a week, they can get the information submitted to us over the phone. Or they can ask other questions about um, how, how to get it or or if they have particular medical questions, they can speak with a nurse. Okay, good. So listen, I, I know that you both are pressed with time and I, I really don't want to monopolize your time because you've got so many other things to do, but let me just take a, a, a I'll throw a couple of questions out there for you to as, use as your wrap up and uh, starting with Dr. Avula here. Uh, one quick question is about uh, kids. I know that, and this ties in of course directly with when kids can go back to school, there's different signs about whether kids ought to be vaccinated or not now versus later when it's available. What's our state's plan on that? Well, at this point, no vaccine has actually been approved for children. Uh, so Pfizer about a month and a half ago was given approval to open up their clinical trials down to age 12. So oh. if we do get approval, Pfizer will be the first one that, to do that. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm guessing it's still a couple months out from a decision on that. Uh, we'll have to see how that progresses for the other candidates. But I, I really don't think that anytime between now and the summer, there will be a, 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 an option or a priority for kids to get vaccinated. Kids meaning under 18? Or uh, sorry. So right now, Pfizer is approved for 16 up to adults. Okay. Their, um, their uh, trials were opened down to 12. Okay. Um, so we'll, we'll know about that 12 to 16 uh, population in probably another two months. Okay. A quick follow up again for Dr. Abula, and then I do have a couple for the county. I know that we have a number of budget items that are in the works in the General Assembly. So we're, we are doing everything we can to make sure we provide you all the fiscal re resources that you need, the state and the county as well. But um, what's generally going to be in terms of the cost? What, what do you what do you think are the places that where you, me as a legislator and others, what can we do to ensure that you have the tools you need? What are you looking for specifically funding wise? Well, you know, I, I Right now, the biggest need is vaccine supply, right? Like we have the channels between our hospitals, our health departments, our providers, our pharmacies. Um, but if vaccine supply were to increase significantly, what we are currently planning for is a large scale fixed site vaccination at about 12 sites throughout the state that have the population density to, to deliver that. So these would be National Guard staffed, thousand to 2000 person a day, seven day a week operations that would be able to get through our population and get us beyond that 50,000 a day clip that we're gonna need to vaccinate Virginia by the middle of the summer. So that would be a, a significant commitment of, of dollars, um, primarily to you know continue having the National Guard deployed and to continue supporting the vaccination staff that would be needed for an effort like that. that that's kind of the first big thing that comes to mind. But the other piece is that, you know, many uh, doctor's offices and health systems have, uh, have, you know, had to 
commit their own resources to do community vaccination. And so I know they're, they're eager to have some of that recouped and there are pathways that are being built to get an administration fee off the vaccine. Um, but then, you know, obviously the federal support and state support for uh, the small businesses that have been hammered throughout this uh, is, is always a need. But in terms of the vaccination effort itself, I think the, the fixed site, large scale um, support moving forward how about the county? What do you need both from the state or from uh, federal government that, I mean, if, if somebody can write you a big check, what would you spend that money on right now if you needed a funding? So I think where one thing that we've seen that won't be fixed immediately um, is that our IT systems, and I think this goes, many health departments would say the same thing, that um, registering people for a novel vaccine that's under emergency use authorization um, and doing it in the quantities and the size that we did is an undertaking that you know, we have never seen before. Um, and I think that what will come out of this is um, a look towards the future at, at IT systems that are kind of accommodate this kind of rapid, rapidly changing scenario. Uh, but I would, I would echo what Dr. Avula said that right now we, here in Fairfax, for example, today, um, I am coming to you from one of our pod sites. So we are, we are doing 3,150 appointments today alone um, over, the, over the course of the 10 hour day. Um, and we have 70 vaccinators, both volunteer and um, our staff. So we are we are very fortunate. We have um, great resources to be able to provide vaccines. So the more vaccine we can get, the more we can we can give it out. Um, and I think that's kind of kind okay. of where we are. Well, uh, so for, first of all, uh, you both have been more than generous. I know, especially Colin, I mean, you are literally out there <laughs> putting a shot in the arms and I'm taking you away from that job. So I thank you. Is there anything else you'd like to, uh, uh, Dr. Avula or, or uh, Colin, anything else you'd like to share with my constituents? And uh, clearly we're gonna provide all the information that you've given us. I, I think we've been uh, updating the, the Facebook Live with all the, you know, like the frequently asked questions and stuff, but is there anything else you want us to make sure that people know about? Yeah, I think my, my take home message would be to recognize that right now, given the supply that's coming in, we have, like I said, 50% of Virginia that's qualified in 1B. And so we've got to we've got to be a little more directive about this from the state. But I think for all of us who, who may fall into 1B for various reasons, uh, to, to be patient and to understand that it's going to be several months before we work through that 1B population given current supply, and to think about who are the members of our community who may need it more than us. And I, I mean, I take my myself and my wife as an example. My wife is a public school teacher. They have committed to virtual for the rest of the year. She got a slot, but she said, you know what? I don't, I don't need it now. Let's give that to somebody who's 75 who really is at a higher risk than I am. And so I, I, I hope that everyone would sort of just think about societally where we need to be prioritizing a very limited resource right now. That's a great message. How about you, Colin? I would echo that. Um, that's what I was going to say. Uh, but the other thing is just from a local, speaking from a local perspective, the vaccination effort is certainly the headline of what we're doing at the moment. But we have not stopped doing case and contact investigation every right. single day. And so for us here in Fairfax, you know, it would be great if we had the same kind of strong diligence and adherence to the tried and true public health practices, wear your mask, keep your distance, wash your hands. Um, the vaccine is, as they say, it's the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, but I think now is not the time to kind of forget what we've learned. And, and we've gotten very good as a, as a state and a county um, at, at practicing those, those infection control practices and we need to keep it up. Well, you, you two have been ex extremely generous with your time. I'll let you both go. I'm going to keep talking on my own, look into a blank screen for 10 more minutes. So thank you. We'll definitely be back in touch. But And if I was in the room, I'd be giving you a big audio uh, clap. But uh, thank you. Appreciate it. Be safe, All folks. Right. Thank All you. Right. Bye. Yeah, thanks. So for the rest of you who are still watching this uh, Facebook Live, let me uh, try to wrap up. We have maybe uh, six or seven minutes before I, uh, my 90-minute alloc allocated time is going to be gone. So first of all, I want to thank once again, not only uh, Dr. Avula, but the entire team at the Virginia Public Health Department. And of course, everybody else is working across the, the, the state. Um, from my own hometown county here, Fairfax County, the amazing work that they're doing. I know there are plenty of things, and I include myself in that. There are plenty of things we can complain about. There are lots and lots of things that uh, don't go as well as we'd like. You know, the fact that phone lines are jammed up, the fact that nobody returns your calls, emails get jammed, the websites crash. I get that. I get it. It happens a lot, and it's frustrating dealing with big bureaucracies. But as you can tell, I mean, these are people, this is you and I, regular folks, trying to help other fellow Virginians in a crisis that we didn't ask for, nor did we anticipate when it happened. 
but we are doing absolutely our best to get over this crisis to come to a point where we can have a little bit more safety and public health for everybody. So I think the, the key message from Dr. Avula and from uh, Colin Brody today is the vaccine is clearly a great place for us to uh, look to for us coming out of this horrible nightmare of the crisis that we have. But vaccine is only one part of that. It is clearly the best solution, but it's not the only solution. The best solution is for you to not be infected right now and to not infect yourself and to spread that infection to others by keeping, keep doing the same thing you've been doing now for nine or 10 months. Wear your mask when you go out. I've actually seen a lot of people wearing two masks now uh, over the last few, few times that I've been outside and watching TV and watching the news. It sounds like, looks like a lot of people wearing two masks. I actually asked somebody why, why people are all of a sudden wearing two masks. It's because of the fear of the new virus strain. You heard from the United Kingdom and from South Africa and other places, there are some new strains of uh, COVID-19 that's kind of you know varying and, and uh, I guess evolving in some ways. And because that might have more potency, even though it might not necessarily be more, uh, more dangerous, there's it may be more infectious. There's more of that uh, stuff that comes out that's the infectious stuff. Uh, you're talking to a guy who flunked bio, so I can't use these technical terms well, but as, as bad things come out of you and may possibly infect others, their thinking is if I wear two masks instead of one, maybe one a medical one, maybe a cotton one, that might maybe prevent. So whatever it takes, please keep wearing your mask and keep practicing your social distancing, keep practicing your uh, personal hygiene, that is a must. And even if six months, eight months, a year from today, when we come together again, I would like for all of us to continue that practice no matter what happens with COVID-19. Uh, second thing, and I wanna just summarize a few things that we weren't able to ask the, the two experts because these things we could go on and on and on. Uh, the, when we talked about this, the two doses, the, it's a political slash uh, it's a political slash um, like a logistical administrative decision that we have to make. Do we allow for all the people that have the first dose to then get the second dose before somebody gets the first dose? Or do we have everybody get first doses first and then wait a little bit and get the second dose? The medical science tells us that you really need both doses at some point or another to become fully, uh, you know, I guess, uh, away from the viruses. And so we do want to make sure that if you've had your first shot, please follow up and get your second shot if you're lucky enough to have been in the, in the first round. Uh, but for those that haven't received your first shot yet, it is coming and the vaccines will be made available. And uh, one last point on that, that issue. And again, I'm not a medical person or science person, but what I've been told is that the, the vaccines, all of a sudden, just because you got your vaccine doesn't mean that you are 100% safe from ever being infected. You may still get infected. It just might not hurt you as much. But more critically, even if you are infected and you don't know that you've been infected, you may have symptoms that you're, uh, or no symptoms, but you may sort of spreading other people. So uh, I think getting the vaccine is clearly important. Now, as Dr. Avula said, you have to be patient about this. Uh, I am, I have no idea where I'm at in, the, in my age and my health and et cetera, et cetera. So, I'm more than happy to wait until the very, very last vaccine is given to us in Virginia and happy to sit in my basement until then. And so uh, I think we just have to allow for those that need it the most, uh, our elderly, our essential workers, our teachers, our frontline workers, whoever needs it, whoever has health concerns, I would be glad to let them go ahead of me and I'll wait my turn. So I, I think that this is one of those moments in our society where we have to decide what our values are, what do we stand for, we as, as Virginians, when we say we care about our society and our community, what does that really mean for us? And so I think if each of us can be a little bit more uh, responsible individually and kind of wait our turn at the same time, making sure that we hold those accountable for doing what they promised that they will do. Uh, let me just also make sure I haven't missed any questions. Uh, my, my, uh, my friend uh, and a constituent who I won't name, but uh, she is a, a dear friend who lives in Providence, lost her mother uh, recently to, to COVID. I know, I know actually she herself was in hospitalized recently as well. And apparently the hospitals itself had some infections because they were not being cleaned very well. The room wasn't clean as a result that her mother unfortunately passed away uh, because of a, a neglectful hospital activities and, and what can we do to make sure that the hospitals are safe. That it's not directly about vaccine, but it certainly is about COVID. And I think uh, Colin, made this, Colin made this point at the end, which is, 
we are, I mean, those offices, the Fairfax and the state, they are the public health office. They're not the vaccine office. They're not the COVID office. They're public health offices. So they have a lot of other things that they have to work on every single day. In addition to the vaccine, in addition to dealing with people that have COVID, it's also overseeing hospitals and doctors, making sure there's access to healthcare, making sure that we are, we are, are providing training for the nurses that are in the schools now. And also there's this new thing that uh, they're looking for, which is a medical resource center, I think it is. They're, they want to recruit. So if you, if you are a person out there and you don't have to be somebody who has a healthcare background, if you want to volunteer to help the county, if you want to volunteer for the state, if you want to volunteer in your area to be part of this massive vaccine rollout, anything, maybe data entry, anything that you can provide as your volunteer time, right now is the time for you to step up. Your state, your country needs you. We need you. We all need each other at this time of crisis. If we're going to have a United Nation, we must come together as a nation and serve each other. So please also look for ways to volunteer. I think you can just search MRC, Medical Resource, something or another. Uh, maybe my staff can uh, drop this in the, in the Facebook Live. But there are ways that you can sign up to volunteer, and then they'll call you to see how you can support us. A uh, couple more questions on this, and uh, I'll, I'll move to wrapping up session. Uh, you heard uh, from the gov from uh, Dr. Avula that there are some costs uh, involved with this, and so the budget. We'll, we'll, I'll, I'll give you a report back after we have the budget bill in the next uh, week or so. But that is cer cer certainly a high priority, as as far as uh, making sure that the state has all the funding that we can allocate to the counties. And I'll just also make a quick plug for my friends who serve in local government. Uh, my my supervisor here in Providence District is uh, Dalia Palchik. And supervisor that represents Vienna and other parts of Hunter Mill is uh, Walter Alcorn, and then Springfield is uh, a gentleman named Pat Herity, and all of our other county folks, including Jeff McCain and others. Uh, they are, I know they're working around the clock. Get on their emails. They, they send out email updates in Fairfax County about the system. I know Jeff McCain just sent the letters to the governor asking for more uh, vaccines and such. So always uh, get as much information from your local as well as your school board, your state, and, and federal officials as possible. So with the last couple of minutes, I wanted to touch on uh, questions that came in throughout this Facebook Live town hall that I didn't get to talk about because uh, we ended up spending a lot of time on vaccine. And uh, my, my friend from uh, Stemwood Elementary School, I won't name names here, but uh, Stemwood Elementary School PTA wants to know about how, when do we go back to school? And clearly that is a hot topic for parents like me and others. Uh, what I said earlier, about maybe an hour ago, so what I said was, the idea of schools being in virtual mode now and how do we transition so that the teachers can get their vaccines. And you heard about the kids, kids are not gonna receive a vaccine until the medical community finds the vaccines that are, are appropriate for kids. So that would be a while. But regardless, how do we ensure that kids get back to school? And while they're still uh, taking virtual classes, what are we doing to ensure that their mental health and their other, uh, other needs are, are met as uh, public school systems? I want to have a conversation about that dedicated to that topic in the next uh, week or so because that that deserves so much more attention and like i did today i want to bring in some experts who really know this stuff well from the various different parts of our state government as well as private sector and let's have a conversation so I have a dedicated town hall on on the status of schools in virginia and let's see what other issues somebody i wanted to ask about um domestic workers issues and other type of economic issues. Oh yeah, I guess we didn't talk too much today about uh, the unemployment situation and our economic situation in, in Virginia related to how COVID has affected us. Uh, number one, please let me know if you have a problem yourself, if you've been unemployed, if you've found yourself in a situation where you're struggling economically and your state hasn't been able to provide you with unemployment right now, uh, let me know. We've been fighting for you every single day. My, my staff and I have been contacting our Virginia Employment Office, I don't know, several times a week for various different case work. And so we'll be happy to do that. I even had a, a case of a, a, a constituent of mine who lives in Vienna, but she actually used to work in Maryland. And so she was laid off from Maryland, but she lives in Virginia. And she was stuck in this gap between Virginia's Employment Commission and Maryland's Employment Commission. So I reached over to the, the Maryland governor's office and found somebody who was able to help her in the Maryland system. So even though I don't serve in other states, I can do whatever I can to connect you with the right people at the federal, state, and local levels across the country to make sure you get the answer. So uh, please contact us. If my staff hasn't done so already, we'll drop our contact information. You can always use social media to contact me as well. And I think it's, uh, oh, 2.30 already. So I think I'm gonna wrap this up. I know you've, I've taken a lot of your time. Uh, Janine, do we have any other questions that came in from Facebook Live? If not, I will. Uh... 
Oh yeah. Uh, there are a couple more questions about uh, vaccines and, and like, how do we follow up after they're registered online with Fairfax County? What I was told today and I've heard from other meetings is that the county public health departments, they, they are the ones that get back to you about when your appointment is. Uh, they have a vested interest in making sure that you show up for your best appointment because what they don't want is not only you being a no-show when you've been scheduled for an appointment, but frankly, that they would have to waste that vaccine shot. Could you imagine as precious as these vaccines are and they allocated it with your name on it and then if you don't show up or there was some kind of a miscommunication where you missed the appointment, either that vaccine is gonna go in somebody else's arm, hopefully a, a first responder who happens to be there, or they have to figure out a way to get you back in the queue maybe weeks or months later. So I know that the county has a vested interest in reaching out to you to ensure that you do show up at the time that you do. But if you can follow up, definitely you should email, phone call. And if you don't get an answer, if you live in my district, please let me know. I'd be happy to, to find out for you. I had a, an example recently of a, an 80 year old woman who uh, signed up, got her appointment, everything was fine. And then all of a sudden she received an email saying, I'm sorry, but you don't qualify because of your age. And so we've canceled your appointment. And we said, wait, she's 80 years old, eight zero. How could you, how could you not qualify for age? And we chased it down. I talked to the county folks and turned out that there was a little bit of a glitch in their system and they accidentally typed in the wrong number as a result. They didn't think that she qualified. So fortunately for her, they were able to ex expedite, get her back in as soon as possible. So she sent me a really nice note afterwards saying, hey, I want to thank you for uh, making sure I got my shot. And in fact, when I showed up, everything went really smoothly. Here's what I did. I, the folks took care of me. I waited. And, and so that was a, a good end to a, what could have been a potentially a bad situation where an 80 year old woman who had she not paid attention to the email might've actually showed up and then found out that she didn't have the vaccine. So uh, please contact me. And that's what I do here. This is my job is to make sure that I can be your liaison between you and your state government. And to the extent we can work with our counties, we'll absolutely do that for you, for you as well. Uh, I think those are pretty much all the questions. Uh, I know my assistant has been dropping the contact information about, you know, just basics on federal, state, local, uh, just frequently asked questions. There was a presentation that Dr. Avila did just recently with our state, uh, state budget folks that you can look at online and there's decks of information. But again, we are all in this together. A year ago, uh, we, when we confronted COVID, it took us a while before we understood the gravity of it. And then when we realized how dangerous it was, Americans came together and most of us did the right thing by wearing our masks, keeping ourselves socially distanced, finding a way to work from home or from somewhere else, keeping ourselves um, away from uh, risky situations, giving up hours and months of precious quality time that we could have been spending with our loved ones and friends instead doing things in isolation for the purpose of saving our country. And even with all that, even with all that amazing work that we did, you and I and others did to sacrifice, even with that, we still lost 400,000 Americans. Even with that, 4,000 Americans are dying every single day because of COVID. So folks, this is not easy. This is not something that we should take lightly. It is still very much a serious, it is still the number one crisis in America. And this is the reason why President Biden is putting all of his resources and time into addressing this. So let's do our part. Our part is to do all we can to maintain that social distance and health, uh, healthy lifestyles and masks, social, uh, the hand washing and being patient and waiting for your turn to get your vaccine because at some point in the next six to eight months or so, when we have 70%, 80% of adults who need the vaccine eligible, uh, vaccinated, that's when we're gonna start seeing the immunity work that will wipe out, hopefully wipe out COVID for good in Virginia. And our kids will be back in school. Our jobs will be opened up again. We'll all be able to go out and have a drink. And, and next, next year at this time, I'll be able to hold a public meeting like this in person instead of uh, online. So until that day, I hope and pray that your family remains safe and healthy. And please stay in touch with me and let me know what I can do for you. Uh, it's an honor to serve you. Thank you.